Thank you all for being here. I'm really excited. I'm Emma Shore, and I'm going to be your MC this evening. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that we're here on stolen Duwamish land and that we're guests in this space. Um, so I am the volunteer co-chair of AgriWatch, which is a campaign of the Community Alliance for Global Justice. AGRA is the <laughs> Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, and it's a multi-million dollar initiative of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And if there are some folks here from the Gates Foundation tonight, we welcome you and we hope you'll find us after. Um, before we dive in, I just want to give a little bit of background on what brought us here tonight. So CAGJ's AgriWatch campaign has been organizing to challenge the Gates Foundation, uh, their role in agricultural development in Africa for over 10 years. And we've done a lot of internal work around the intersection of philanthropy and capitalism and asked a lot of questions about power and accountability and colonialism. And during that time, we found that a lot of folks in Seattle have kind of an uncritical stance towards philanthropy and think that all giving is good giving. Um, and especially, you know, a, a place like the Gates Foundation, which is giving away so much money that that's kind of quote unquote, it's, it's just a, a good thing to do to give away that much money. Uh, so we thought that we needed to challenge this idea and that donating money always results in good things and raise awareness um, specifically around the problems of the type of philanthropy that the Gates Foundation engages in, which tonight we're calling philanthrocapitalism, which I know is a big word, but we'll get into it. Um, and we also really believe in the importance of community and political education in mobilizing as a mobilizing force. And that's kind of how we came to this idea of holding this event. Um, and then we were so excited to join with Social Justice Fund, which is a regional leader around uh, alternative models to philanthropy. And we expanded beyond this critique um, and kind of got into what all our alternative funding might look like, which tonight we are calling social justice philanthropy. And then all of us to get, came together with resource generation and Thousand Currents who are working nationally and internationally uh, to transform philanthropy. And that's why we're here putting on this panel. So um, this is also really an exciting moment in time, I think, to be having this panel because people are politicized and impassioned and really wanting to take action. And one way that we can do that is by giving away our resources um, to causes that we believe in. And so after several years of planning, we're here um, finally doing this event. And uh, in talking about philanthropy, we're also inherently talking about class and privilege. And I just want to make space for that and know that that can be messy and uncomfortable and just invite all of us to really lean into whatever that feels like and let it be messy and uncomfortable and know that through that process, we will hopefully grow together and individually. Um, and we're so grateful for our, all of our partners here who are making this really possible. So, because we have such a large group tonight, we're gonna have Q&A and you can write your questions on a card like this, which are at the back. Hopefully you got one coming in. And then there'll be volunteers coming around throughout the, um, the questions of, from the panel to, to collect those. Um, and then at the end of the, the event, we are encouraging you all to share your thoughts about what we should do next and where we should go from here um, on these pieces of paper, which are posted around the room. So feel free to find those or talk to one of us um, at the end of the event. And we, we really view this as part of our ongoing organizing and um, welcome your ideas on what else we need to do to build community and move forward. So finally, we're on social media, so you can share CAGJ Seattle posts and use our hashtags. And that should be it. I want to introduce our amazing panelists. So on Skype, we have Salome Lemma, who is joining us from Oakland, and we're so excited she's here. She is the Deputy Director at Thousand Currents. And then we have Burke Stansbury. He is the Director of Development at the Social Justice Fund. And next, we have Simone Adler. Uh, they are Organizing Director at CAGJ and the Coordinator of the AgriWatch Campaign. And 
then finally we have Ruth Soil Sawyer. They are a member leader at Resource Generation. And I'm just going to let them talk more about themselves. Um, so to start out, I would love if you could tell all of us a little bit of your personal story, how you came to be here, and what your initial take on the question at the heart of this event is, who profits from philanthropy? So I guess I'll go. Uh, my name is Burke Sansbury. Uh, as Emma said, I'm the development director at Social Justice Fund Northwest. Um, we are a foundation, uh, a grant-making organization that raises all the money that we give away. Um, and we do that through a, a process that's called giving projects. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later when we get to the kind of alternatives. But I wanted to just tell a little bit of my personal story and what brings me here first. Um, so a big part of my story about philanthropy and getting involved in philanthropy um, has to do with the fact that when I was in my early 20s, I inherited about a million dollars from my grandparents um, in a trust fund. And um, it happened that at around that time, I was you know, getting through college. I had been a student activist. I was becoming an organizer. I was reading a lot of Marx. You know, I was... Uh, thinking a lot about issues and, and organizing and, and suddenly found myself sort of on the, on the wrong side of the, the class divide, at least as I was defining it with my own political an analysis developing. And, and so I, I grappled a lot with the fact that I had inherited money um, and, and ultimately decided that I wanted to, to give most of the money or all of the money away. Um, so I, uh, and, and especially thinking about sort of how the, the money had come to be mine, like basically I didn't, you know, I was like, it's, it's not my money. The, the way that this money has been uh, accumulated by my grandfather, um, he, you know, it was various different things, but he, among other things, he, he uh, had uh, uh, an apple orchard and made apple juice. He eventually made berry wine and, and then grape wine and started uh, a winery um, that became San Michel Winery. Um, and so, you know, made a lot of money by exploiting migrant uh, workers and migrant labor. Um, and Rosalinda, who's here tonight, ultimately uh, uh, formed the first ever uh, farm workers union at Saint Michel. But that was after, after <laughs> he sold the company, for what it's worth. Um, but, but so thinking a lot about that, you know, I decided that, that I wanted to give, give away this money. So I went to my parents when I was about 25 years old and said, I want to give away all this money. And needless to say, my parents didn't react so well to that, to that concept. Um, but, but I kind of turned it around on them and said, well, then how about you give away more of your money and we put together a family foundation and start to, to support grassroots organizations and groups that are really working for social change. Um, and they went along with that, um, to, their, to their credit. Um, and about that time, too, I found resource generation. And Ruth's going to talk more about resource generation. Um, but I um, kind of came upon this idea of redistribution. Like, not only did, did the wealth that I have need to be redistributed, but, but I needed to, to organize other people to, to do the same thing, other wealthy people. And not just wealth, but also land and, and power. Um, so I started going to philanthropy conferences. I was going to dive right into this world. I was going to get other people to do, you know, give away more money. And what I found pretty quickly is that not all foundations were, were, also, were onto this idea of redistribution. That was not the like, core of their, of their values. Um, in fact, it seemed like there was a lot of sort of hoarding of wealth and power that was going on within the philanthropy world. Um, and a lot of the money that was being given away was going to things that were actually benefiting the elite um, and not necessarily the people who were, who were trying to, to change the, the in, inequities that exist in our society. So um, it sort of got me questioning the whole concept and model of philanthropy um, and, and whether you know, there was actually the possibility of addressing the the real like root ca causes and structures of, of inequality and injustice that exists in our society. So, um, so that's, that's kind of like how I came into this, this world. I started as an organizer. I ended up being involved in philanthropy in so many ways. And I definitely like believe in the idea of philanthropy. I don't think we should just throw it out. Like I think if people have too much money or more money than they need to, to live and thrive in the world, then they should give a lot of it away. And the question is, like, how do we do that uh, well and accountably? And I think that's what we're, we're going to talk more about today. Thank you. All right. 
Can you guys hear me? Cool. Okay. Um, so again, my name is Simone, and I'm with Community Alliance for Global Justice and our Agro Watch campaign. Um, and so just to share a little bit about who I am, where I'm coming from. Um, yeah, I began organizing as a young person, um, just being exposed to social justice issues in my community and my family, um, and my own experiences with economic injustice. And I soon, um, in high school, I became very interested in the issue around access to clean water um, and the right to access clean water globally. Um, and through that, I started to learn more about the privatization of common goods and common resources around the world. Um, and that led me to understand more about the, the way that capitalism and systemic oppression are linked. And I began doing community organizing around food and land on a local level um, and making connections to corporations and institutions that are basically trying to suppress community power um, everywhere. So yeah, so to talk a little bit about like why we decided to call this event Who Profits from Philanthropy. Um, it centers the question that underlies the dynamics of wealth, power, and privilege that are keeping our capitalist structures in place and, um, and therefore don't, not getting to the root of, of the problem. Um, and you know, coming into this work through, to also through the movement for food sovereignty um, which is about democratizing our food system and, you know, putting the people and communities into, into the position of controlling, like, how we grow our food and who has access to it um, and who grows it. Um, I, we made the connections around um, talking about who profits um, because from a profit-making standpoint, um, you know, it, it brings up questions of who is in control um, who, who is, how is like self-determination being respected in the, in the process? Um, and what are the actual outcomes? And um, in, in our organizing and in the work that we're involved in, um, we know that when, when communities are the ones in control, um, you know, over their own production methods and, and uh, growing processes and everything, then they can actually reap what they sow. Um, so that, that's sort of like, where this idea was coming from. Um, and I also just wanted to give a little bit more background on the Agro Watch campaign, um, just to speak to like, the term Green Revolution, which is uh, the Alliance for Green Re Revolution is, is what Agro stands for, as Emma mentioned earlier. Um, so the first Green Revolution happened in the 1960s, and it was an attempt to basically solve the issue of hunger around the world, um, experimenting with new technology for how to increase the harvests of crops and how to um, experiment with new fertilizers. Um, and this was being done in Mexico and in India and in other parts of the world. Um, but we saw that uh, the impacts of this were, were many and they were long lasting um, even to today, including like devastation of land and the environment, um, farmers being trapped into cyclical debt and destruction of livelihoods and traditions. And so, um, now, through AGRA, through the Alliance for Green Revolution, the Gates Foundation um, is doing this all over again, and uh, doing this on the African continent. And um, the, tech, the, the argument has, has basically remained the same, which is that technology is the answer to food insecurity and hunger. Um, so we, we challenge this notion. Um, and support community-led initiatives across the African continent that are organizing for food sovereignty and agroecology. Um, and yeah, so we want to have this, this conversation about who profits because in essence, um, the agricultural programs of the Gates Foundation and, and Agra are really benefiting transnational biotech corporations at the cost of farmer self-determination and food sovereignty. Lovely. <laughs> um, so my name is Ruth, um, and the two questions were, how did I come to be here, and what's my initial take on who profits from philanthropy? Uh, so I want to start with the first one. I was asked to be here as a member leader uh, with Resource Generation, um, and I'm also wearing my other hat of um, 
someone who's in conversation with an organization called Regenerative Finance, uh, which is about investment. And I'll talk more about that in the second question. Um, so you might be wondering, what is resource generation? Uh, Burke talked a little bit about it. Um, it's an organization of young people with wealth working for the redistribution of wealth, land, and power. Uh, so that looks like um, the people who are involved are 18 to 35. Um, some are inheritors. Some don't have access to cash or to stocks, but um, have access to family foundations or other ways that they can um, create movement in money. Um, others are what we call earners. Um, although some dispute that their money is actually earned, but who are making a lot of profit as tech workers or bankers or um, things like that through work. I got involved in 2011, um, and I joined the Seattle organizing team in 2012. Um, so you might wonder, what, is, what does that look like to organize young people with wealth? Um, so one thing in redistributing wealth, land, and power is uh, literally helping people move money um, and move access to money. So that means giving away a lot of money. Um, and that also means helping people organize their families to move money and to, uh, kind of like Burke talked about, to get their families to give away more money um, and give it away to more socially accountable um, things. It also means organizing. If all of us in RG gave away every single cent we have, uh, it likely wouldn't do a lot. So we want to change the system that made us wealthy as well as um, simply change the status of our wealth. Um, and this partly, this organization partly looks like telling stories that only we have access to um, about how, how resources are funneled to wealthy people, um, including stuff like Burke said about what happens in those philanthropy conferences. Um, So one thing that I like to think about, about uh, the lens that, that resource generation brings to things is philanthropy often thinks about ending poverty. And I think we like to flip that and think about ending wealth because wealth perhaps is the cause of poverty. <laughs> um, so that's the organizing we're doing. So that second question, uh, who profits from philanthropy? Um, so one thing that, uh, from hearing a lot of people's stories in resource generation, one thing I've learned is that the easiest way to make money is to have money. That's the way the system is set up. Um, so unless you are very, very intentional and very, uh, what's the word? Unless you have sort of the right analysis about addressing the power dynamics and addressing racism and colonialism, the, the things that have allowed you to become wealthy you're not changing the system, and therefore the same thing that you're doing is, is continuing to funnel money to you. Um, that being said, it's really important to continue to engage and not aim for perfection and give up. Um, the solution is, isn't for wealthy people to say, well, philanthropy's flawed, I guess we'll keep all our money. <laughs> um, so one of the most important things um, in this conversation for me is to stay engaged and not kind of end up with a critique hat that doesn't do anything. Thanks, Ruth. Uh, Salome, can we try to get back to you and see if we can hear you this time around? Absolutely. Can you hear me now? Yeah. It's a little better. OK, I'll try to slow. I'll do that. Um, hello again. Uh, my name is, as we said, Salome Lumba, and I am the Deputy Director of Thousand Currents. Thousand Currents uh, funds, walks alongside and connects grassroots groups and movements in Africa, Asia, and Latin America that work at the intersection of food sovereignty, alternative economies, and climate justice. We work with groups that are led by women, young people, and indigenous peoples, and I'll speak more about that later. Uh, but in terms of my own journey into philanthropy, I, I was saying earlier that I'm from Ethiopia, and my first experience of philanthropy was as a practice of community solidarity. Um, I saw in my communities how people self-organized 
through their collective resources and responded to the individual and community needs that they encountered. Be it helping someone with their health care expenses or contributing to um, community infrastructure like water and like systems or um, so my first entry and introduction to philosophy was through lived experience, and I didn't see philosophy as something that was served for the wealthy or the rich. I also didn't know it was called philanthropy. I thought it's just what you do when you live in community. You show up in solidarity. But my professional entry point into philanthropy was once I graduated from school and started working with large international development organizations. And I had two particular experiences, one in Ethiopia and one in Liberia, where I really saw firsthand the problems of exported development, the ways in which these ideas just don't lead to transformative changes in community. Um, and at the same time, the local groups and leaders and communities I met and encountered showed me what promising change looks like, what transformative, transformative change looks like. They had brilliant ideas. They were not getting the funding because all the funding was going to be huge institutions. Um, in that respect, I started to question why does philanthropy benefit those with resources and access and not the people that are actually affected by the challenges to try to solve and that actually have the solutions that will get, out of, get us out of these challenges. So I thought when I graduated or when I returned um, back to the United States, I, would, I want to be on the side of whatever it is that allows me to distribute to, to, to redistribute resources to communities that are working to transform their own change, that are self-determining their own change. So that's how I ended up in philanthropy. And to get to that question around who profits from it, um, we can have a really important fundamental conversation about should philanthropy exist, right? Should this self-perpetrating entity exist? And it's important. Uh, and at the same time, I think we should talk about what type of philanthropy are we talking about when we say who profits from it. The type of philanthropy that feeds the neoliberalism, um, that maintains the status quo, that doesn't challenge the uh, global capitalism, benefits a few. But there is a type of philanthropy that is grounded in social justice, that aims to redistribute resources, that works in partnership with and in support of self-determined communities, that is asking really difficult and critical questions about transformative change. That type of philanthropy, I think, benefits us all, not just the donor and the grantee, but all of us. Thank you so much, Salome, and I'm really glad we can hear you now. Is that better for everybody? Okay, great. <laughs> but, you know, one thing maybe on the next question is to try to use your headset, too. It might even be better. I mean, I don't know. Oh, you got it. Oh, All right. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. So, okay. I can see it. All right. Good suggestion. <laughs> All right. Um, so I want to kind of get back to at, um, what Salome was just talking about, about these different types of philanthropy and what some of you have started to touch on, which is the, this idea of philanthro capitalism. And if you could just talk more about what that means to you and give some specific examples, I'd like to hear from, maybe we can start with you, Salome, and then go to... Uh, Burke and Simone. Or do you want to do you want to start? Burke? Yeah, let me let okay. me go first since we switched around the order yeah, yeah. before. If that's all right. Um, so, so yeah, this question, this idea of philanthro capitalism. Um, how many people had actually heard of that term before this event or before you saw the promotion? So, so few people. Um, it was actually coined by. A, uh, an economist uh, writer uh, back in I think like 2008 um, and it's the idea you know that that business uh, can that, that the sort of principles of business and capitalism should be applied to philanthropy and nonprofits and the nonprofit sector to make it more efficient and effective and innovative and and all those catchphrases um, that that are sometimes used around that um, what I would suggest is that it's not necessarily like a new idea um, in philanthropy and, and actually it's been called other things throughout, throughout history um, or throughout the, the history of like modern philanthropy in this country. 
um, which really started with like the at the turn of the 20th century with the, the Carnegies and the Rockefellers and the Henry Fords um, and you know some people might know that history you know sort of the the robber barons as they're as they're known who who made a lot of money through steel or oil or these these big extractive industries or, or labor-intensive industries and then turned around and created the first mega foundations um, at that time and they uh, they did it in a way that um, also set up a tax system that really benefited those those foundations um, got big tax benefits for for making for creating foundations um, interestingly there wasn't actually a rule until 1969 that you had to give away any of the money in your foundation so you could you could create a foundation and pay yourselves and your family members as trustees but never actually make grants um, that law only changed in, in 1969. But the, so the, the, but the original idea was, and, and a lot of people have called it like entrepreneurial philanthropy, but like, you know, sort of cr making lots of money and then turning around and giving it away. Um, and I think our common narrative in this country is like that comes from alt altruism. Like that these, these guys have worked hard and, and most of them are our guys, um, have worked hard and now they're gonna give it back. You know, they're gonna give something back. And that's definitely one, one way of looking at it. Um, and, and, there, and there's certainly part of that. But I think also there is an element of, of benefit and gain and, and power accumulation that goes on, goes along with having a foundation and being involved in philanthropy. Your, you know, the, the networks, the social capital, um, the tax breaks that I mentioned, the, the media, the kind of media coverage and, and all the sort of praise that is, that is uh, you know, put on people who, who have foundations um, turns around and actually ends up benefiting their, their business ventures as well. Um, so uh, there's, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a thing, there's a challenging thing there. And I think the biggest problem for me around this, and I'll, I'll try to kind of wrap up and talk about more, more of this later too, is that is that element of, of uh, power and control um, and having been an organizer and been on the other side of funding, um, I've, I've seen that really play out where foundations will, um, will donate money in a way that really sort of dictates policy, dictates strategy, tells you who to work with, you know, actually forms the coalition for you, names your campaign, gives you a bunch of money to go do it, and then, but you're like, but this actually isn't what we wanted to do, but we can't turn down this money because it's, it's so hard, you know, because the nonprofit world is so hard to get money in the first place. So we got to take it, but now we're doing something that we wouldn't have actually done otherwise. And it's, it's that element of control and power, having seen that as an organizer, that, that makes me really want to question and change this, this idea of philanthropic capitalism and just the way that, that philanthropy functions at the, at the macro level. CHJ and AgriWatch situate um, our understanding of philanthropic capitalism specifically in its relationship with agricultural development. And um, as many of you, I'm sure, know or experience, agriculture around the world has been and continues to be increasingly industrialized and corporatized, um, meaning that big agribusiness corporations buy out the land, which destabilizes um, farmers' access to ownership of the land. Um, and uh, can, can remove that access ultimately, um, rely on industrial farming methods, uh, such as like high input chemical fertilizers and monocropping, also leading to health risks. Um, the, these corporations promote genetically modified seeds um, while criminalizing traditional seed saving and also reducing the wages and rights of farmers and workers um, in order to increase output and production. So the way that we see philanthropy entering this model of, um, of, of agricultural development is through funding processes that basically aim to increase production and connect farmers to global markets. That might sound benevolent, um, but there's actually very specific marketable objectives that philanthropists have in mind 
um, when, when doing that. And so um, one, one way that we've seen this is through like, specifically promoting a variety of crop that they have invested money into um, and wanting to see that get to market and being, and being used um, and, and marketing it as a solution to hunger. Or um, influencing political decision makers to legislate policy um, that will basically bring in profit for privatized seed corporations, for example. Um, so basically seeing the capitalist business model um, as the way to address uh, global structural problems. And um, yeah, essentially this is an ideological commitment to neoliberal economic policies and corporate globalization. Um, it's prioritized over the voices, knowledge, and self-determination of communities who are struggling for land reform and food sovereignty, um, often who are practicing uh, methods of agriculture that they have scientifically developed over generations um, that, that are taking into account local conditions that these big philanthropists sitting far away in other countries probably have no um, actual relationship to. Um, so the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is one such example of this. Um, and in fact, it's the largest charitable foundation in the world with assets of over $40 billion. Um, and it's based here in Seattle. Um, if you didn't know, and the, <laughs> the Gates Foundation invests in uh, invests more in in uh, global health than any government does. Um, it's also the fifth fifth largest donor to agriculture in the world. So essentially, the foundation and Bill Gates himself has become one of the most influential actors um, in agricultural development. Um, I'm going to try to skip through what I was going to say a little bit. But um, yeah, so with the Rockefeller Foundation, the Gates Foundation launched um, the Alliance for a Green Revolution in 2006. Um, in practice, it's basically a subsidiary of the Gates Foundation. Um, it's arguing that agribusiness and biotechnology will solve hunger in Africa. Um, and this is ignoring the, the history and legacy of colonization of Africa and also post-colonial development that's been very much impacted by the World Bank and, um, and other financial institutions. Um, and two key ways that we see AGRA and the Gates Foundation influencing this is um, it's the leading funder of research into genetically engineered foods and crops for Africa and the leading funder in biotechnology for genetically modified hybrid seeds and high input chemical fertilizers. And the other way is that it funds public relations initiatives, um, institutions, organizations that are part of this big web of actors and that includes corporate giants. Um, and they are pressuring to change national regulations and policy that promote the adoption of GMOs and privatized seeds and other farming methods. Um, so basically promoting neoliberal corporate interests. Um, and I just, just wanted to touch in quickly about um, a couple areas of influence that I think are important to name. Um, because uh, the foundation has, is donating so much money, it um, has access to world leaders. It's, like one of, it's the only private non-governmental organization that's sitting on in international bodies um, like the UN and the World Health Organization next to governments. But the accountability there um, is missing in that, you know, unlike governments, there's no mechanism for um, democratic processes. Um, and, uh, and then in addition, um, the foundation also donates to large public research universities to carry out biotechnology research. Um, and in effect is, is basically buying the allegiance and silencing academic criticism, um, even of NGOs and the media as well. Um, so one, one specific area that, that we talk about in AgriWatch is um, the Cornell Alliance for Science, with the, which the Gates Foundation has um, started through granting $5.6 million. Um, it's out of the Cornell University in, in Ithaca. And um, it's essentially a public relations front for advancing the agenda of corporatized agriculture and developing this narrative against GMOs. Um, and then, yeah, I guess should wrap up, but um, <laughs> there's a lot to say and I hope I can get to it later. Um, I think, yeah, the the way in which the Gates has relationships with, with some controversial um, big corporations like Monsanto is also important to mention. Um, in 2010, AgriWatch actually helped expose that relationship that 
The Gates had significant investments in Monsanto, including over $23 million in stock, um, which it doesn't currently have, but Monsanto is a partner of several GMO projects in Africa that Gates invests in um, through both research and pushing its product. Um, the heads of the agricultural development and research programs of the foundation came from Monsanto. Um, and one of the ways that Agra pushes um, hybridized seeds, for example, in, in Africa is through what, what is known as agro-dealer networks. And Monsanto um, is one of the main suppliers in those networks. So that relationship is still very much there. Um, and yeah, I think I'll end there for now. <laughs> Sure. Um, I think Simone gave us a really great overview. And for Thousand Currents, as an organization that funds at the intersection of food sovereignty, economic justice, and climate justice, um, I can relate to so much of what she just, what they just described earlier. But um, I think, you know, I think it's, I see funds or capitalism as a set of practices that are, that center the market and neoliberalism that are entrenched in global capitalism, um, that offer solutions as products and technologies, and that are really invested in maintaining the status quo. So no critical questions are asked about transforming existing systems and structures. And in that respect, I see it in many other places um, outside of the examples given earlier. Um, I think you know one example is um, I've noticed a growing number of wealthy emerging scientists in the global south who are taking kind of heated leadership from foundations here at my gates and adopting funds or capitalist models as they establish their own local foundations and philanthropies. Um, I also see philanthropic capitals and express itself through ideas like venture philanthropy or through even uh, at times masked languages like the or social entrepreneurs or turning um, social change into an entrepreneurial endeavor. Um, so in that respect, I think we also, in our work, see philanthropic capitalism expressed through impact investment, right? It's, that's another expression of philanthropic capitalism in some ways, um, uh, because philanthropic capitalism, in many ways, um, privatizes social change. Um, it turns social and environmental commons into, into capital markets that can be, into goods that can be exchanged on the capital market. And it often is not accountable to governments or the public. Um, it lacks accountability infrastructures and it looks at change, social transformation as a return on investment. So for me, to keep this short, because I know we're running a little over time, um, philanthropic capitalism is the philanthropies that, uh, whose practices reflect any of the things that all of us have mentioned during this part of the discussion. Um, so Salome, you mentioned impact investing and Simone also mentioned investing a lot. So I'm hoping that Ruth and Salome, you might be able to expand more on impact investing, which has emerged as a middle ground between traditional philanthropy and for-profit market-based endeavors. Um, and I just also want to remind everyone to fill out your question cards and pass them up if you have them. Heather will collect them. Um, but Ruth, do you want to take a stab at that? Yes. <laughs> take a stab. <laughs> um, OK, so I'm putting on my regenerative finance hat. Um, when thinking about investing, just if you'd like to find out more, um, that's an organization to look up. Um, so I want to take this question in, in two different ways. Uh, one way is to contextualize why I think talking about investing and impact investing really matters to a discussion of philanthropy. Um, so when we critique philanthropy, a lot of times we critique where the money is going. And sometimes we critique where the money comes from. But what, what I um, am consistently remembering is that there's another piece of philanthropy. So it's not that they've got a pool of money that's being given away. There's a pool of money that was the original money that then is often put into an endowment, which means that it's invested in the stock market or other types of investments. So often in like a typical foundation, this is invested in exactly the companies that are causing the damage that they're purporting to solve. 
and they're investing the maybe 6% return on their investment into solving this problem. So that's a huge problem when 94% of their money is creating the problem and 6% is dedicated to solving it. Um, so impact investing um, is really crucial to this discussion because we know that so-called socially responsible investments are sort of um, greenwashed. There's, you know, maybe they don't have ExxonMobil, but they do invest in Halliburton and McDonald's. So uh, those aren't really the things that you're like, yes, they're going to solve world hunger. <laughs> well, maybe you do think that. But um, anyway, so impact investing is envisioned as this way to uh, do good while making money. So now the question of, is that, is that real? Is that a thing <laughs> that works? Um, and I think mostly the answer is no. Like philanthropy, there's promise, but mostly the answer is no. Um, so one of the first questions is who is able to do impact investing? And one of the key, uh, key things is that in most mainstream funds, in order to even play the game, in order to become an accredited investor, you need more than a million dollars in capital to give. So the people who are, who are doing impact investing, who are making decisions about what is good, uh, are tremendously wealthy. Um, so then they get to define what is good. Uh, they get to define it without talking about racism, without talking about colonialism, without talking about capitalism. And as I talked about earlier, if you don't talk about those things, you probably are perpetuating those things. Um, if you're, you know, wealthy and white and all those things. Um, and sometimes if not as well. Um, but then uh, there's this discussion of like, how much money should we be making on impact investing? And a lot of uh, these investors have a huge commitment to making just as much money as they would make in the stock market. And you know, you talk about maybe you could do more good if you made less money and they get super defensive. Like that's the number one principle is to make about the same money as you would otherwise. Um, which I think, I, I don't know, I think it's interesting this, this idea that you need to charge interest, um, you need to basically charge people for the use of your money, um, or that you'd need to like create a world where you're making, uh, yeah, you're making this, this market return. So I think, I think overall impact investing is, is kind of a, a wasteland, although um, there are some really cool projects that are happening, happening at the same time. Yeah. Thanks, Ruth. We can hear about those projects later. Uh, Salome, could you give us your take on impact investing? Absolutely. Um, I think I'm going to talk about one of those cool projects now <laughs> in response to this question. Um, I agree. Um, I, I think conventional impact investing is wrought with challenges and flaws, and we at Thousand Currents are really interested in transforming philanthropy or impact investments. So just yesterday, we launched a, our venture, quote-unquote venture, into impact investment through a fund that we call Blend of the Year Fund. And it's really our attempt to see if we can redefine what investment is and what investment relationships can look like. And we started this process by bringing together a number of our grantee partners as well as a number of interested investors into one space in Mexico to talk about what could this look like? What does reimagining of impact investment look like in our context? It's a journey that we've been on for about a year and a half to two years. And this collective of grantee partners and, invest and investors, as well as thousand currents, have come together to create the Buen Vizier Fund. And Buen Vizier is actually a term that, that we've um, learned from, borrowed from, and have been inspired by um, our partners, um, particularly indigenous groups and movements in Latin America. Buen Vizier means um, right living. There isn't really, there's not a great translation for it. In, in the indigenous languages, it's, it's a much more beautiful word and meaning. But it means right living. It really looks at how do we create a life of balance the, um, with natural environment, with communities, and with future generations. <laughs> and in that respect, we came together to say, can we co-create and co-design a fund that really pursues um, economies of well-being and balance? 
um, and to me redefine and flip impact investment um, kind of show the paradigm on impact investment. And we, I think we've, start, we've undertaken a process that is promising. It's new, but it's, it's a journey of learning that, we, that we're on. And we've, what we've committed to is to do impact investment differently. And the ways in which we're doing that is, for example, in conventional impact investment, the governing and decision-making structure um, lies with the board or the leadership. Um, and I'll, in one of your fund, the General Assembly comprised of investors and grantee partners, are, they're the decision makers. And to tilt the balance towards the grassroots groups and movements, we actually have more grassroots groups and movements than investors. And everyone has an equal vote and an equal decision making authority. Um, for example, in conventional impact investment, risk is often assumed by the investors. Right, they invest in, in, in fact, investors draw contracts and legal documents to make sure all of the risk is assumed by the investee. And in this collective imaginings of risk, risk is actually assumed by the investor. There is a thoughtful, um, complex process of discernment, dialogue, and community decision making. But as a collective, we will try to assume the risk um, collectively as opposed to having to follow one organization who, for whatever reason, may not be able to live up to the expectations of, um, of or the agreements that they signed on to. Um, likewise, you, you know, we brought up the question of interest. Uh, we do not charge interest. Um, what we have is what we call up a based or solidarity contributions. Each group, investors and investees, or the investors groups, um, choose what a forte contribution they want to make. It can be financial or non-financial. And in many cases, the forte contribution that they're, they're committing themselves to is greater than what an interest earning would have been. But this is a solidarity contribution. Um, and lastly, uh, we imagine returns differently. We're not looking at just returns on financial investment or some social environmental metrics, but we're also looking at returns on financial um, financial returns, from the real returns, uh, medium building returns, as well as learning returns. Um, so this is, um, as I mentioned, we just lost this yesterday, and there's a lot more extensive information on the, on the website, but I do think there's a way in which we can redefine and reframe our relationship with many investments, and this is an attempt to do so through an inspiration from indigenous communities in Latin America. Awesome. It's really great to hear when things are working well. And I, uh, for our last question for all of you, from me, I would just love to hear about what the alternatives are and um, can philanthropy truly contribute to social change? And if so, what does that look like? And I see people are passing up questions, but just continue to do that. Um, do you want to start? I can start. Um, so one of the things I started with was the importance of having a really strong critique, but also then not, uh, not giving into the temptation to give up, uh, to continue to engage in creating philanthropy that will eliminate the need for philanthropy. Um, so there, I heard a story recently from a Resource Generation member that really inspired me in this regard. Um, and she had moved so she found uh, in college that, that her family had started a foundation and she was expected to take part and just like had this really reaction of, of uh, pushing it away and critiquing it really intensely. Um, and then realized through uh, working with social justice organizations that like, wait a second, like all these organizations really need funding. Maybe my job here isn't, isn't to like be in these frontline communities, but to to work with my family and make change in my family. And so she went back and kind of through this long process, like wrested control of the family foundation, uh, not through forcing people, but through having these open conversations about what do you want and how can we get there together? Um, and then uh, at, at this point, their foundation is now working towards addressing root causes of, of social justice issues. Um, working, uh, have, has a race class analysis, um, and is giving multi-year funding. Uh, so I, I like really loved hearing that story because she talked about the need to wrestle with the contradictions um, and to, to like be engaged in the thing that, that is not perfect. Um, 
So one thing uh, I love that regenerative finance does actually is reframing financial terms, uh, including investing. And instead of thinking about it as a financial term, to think about it as uh, becoming invested. So on this panel, we've definitely been critiquing big philanthropy uh, and big investing. But I think it's important in our responses uh, to think about how we can become invested, uh, engaging directly with the systems that we are in and intervening in their contradictions instead of stepping away from, from the plate, as it were. Um, so I think philanthropy can contribute to social change, but it requires some really deep engagement. Um, so, in thinking about what is the alternative to philanthro capitalism and that that uh, model of agricultural development, like the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa, um, we like to say that food sovereignty is the solution, not another green revolution. And um, this just kind of speaks to the fact that hunger is not something addressed through nutrient-fortified GMOs and business models that increase corporate profits. Um, it's a systemic and structural problem rooted in legacies of colonialism and white supremacy, which must be addressed through the leadership of impacted communities for the long term, um, which is what we've kind of been all saying. And um, so just thinking about the alternative, it's moving from this model of charity toward justice. Um, like the Gates Foundation, for example, re reinforces this myth that development is about charity and delivering high profile technological solutions to the poor, which tends to then depoliticize the problem. Um, but it's, it's poor folks and it's people in their communities who know what, um, what is best and, and what they need in terms of justice, um, equity and access. And it's really at this level that, that people have the most grounded perspective on how to get there. Um, so when they're not invited to the table, the, the approach is that this kind of philanthropic capitalism becomes the development model itself. And, um, and the rich are seen as saviors while, while the poor are simply recipients of their benevolence. Um, so this is not justice. And, and poor folks, especially farmers, like in, in what we've been talking about around agriculture, um, tend to not ask for charity, but instead are actually demanding justice. Um, so it's about a fundamental systemic change in power, um, and we just don't really see that in like the Gates and other big philanthropists' um, agendas. So um, yeah, so the alternative that, that farmers are organizing toward is food sovereignty and agroecology. Um, and food sovereignty is an intersectional movement started in, by peasant farmers in the global south, um, to oppose reliance on chemical fertilizers and expensive seeds and GMOs. Um, and it, it promotes the practice of agroecology as a method of farming um, because it has been proven to be highly productive, increase harvests, um, is sustainable, promotes biodiversity, addresses climate change, and actually helps realize the right to food. Um, so it's both a form of agriculture and a process in, in organizing and building community self-determination. Um, and I just want to name, too, that at, at the root of, of these social movements, it actually takes institutions to fund the work. And so we need funders to support grassroots organizing um, for self-determination and move resources into a model of accountability, um, which is why the work of Thousand Currents, for example, and, and Grassroots International is so essential and transformative because they're actually funding social movements, which is the essential difference that we've been talking about. Um, and just really quickly to give a couple concrete examples, um, I, I just wanted to share that in Kenya, which has been on the receiving end of many of the Gates Foundation's um, agricultural programs, um, the Grow Biointensive Agriculture Center of Kenya, which is um, known as GBIAC, does farmer-to-farmer -farmer training on agricultural methods and other forms of community development um, for small-scale farmers. And they have multiple agroecology farm centers and their success in actually increasing food production, improving soil fertility, and strengthening a national family farm movement is incredibly inspiring. Um, and also another example is the resistance to the Gates-funded uh, genetically modified banana, um, which is a vitamin A enriched banana um, pushed on Uganda and other East African countries. Um, it was developed by researchers at one university and then 
like sent to Iowa State University where it was tested on undergraduate students, women students, and um, there's concerns there about biopiracy of that development too and the way that it was genetically developed and also the health impacts. Um, and AgriWatch, we helped establish a, national, a transnational coalition to resist the super banana um, and coordinating with activists in South Africa and Uganda and Kenya, um, supporting students in, at Iowa State University who were pressuring the administration not to carry out the trials. And while, while that um, activism on, on the university didn't lead to um, stopping the trials, it, it did turn out that um, there was a lot of, of attention and international attention to the genetically modified banana. And it also offered a new model of transnational organizing around food sovereignty. Um, so that was something we like to lift up. Cool. Um, I know we want to wrap up soon here so we can get to some questions and stuff. Um, I did just want to mention, because I know Salome is still a little hard to hear at times, just the, the fund that she talked about specifically. It's called the Buen Vivir Fund that they just launched. Um, and so I just wanted to emphasize that and you can look it up and learn more about this kind of alternative form of impact investing that she was talking about. <laughs> Buen is B-U-E-N and Vivir um, is V I V. E-R. I-R. Thank you. It's hard, hard to spell out loud. Uh, okay, yes, yeah, so Buen Vivir Fun, look it up on the Thousand Currents website. Um, so I'm just going to talk really quickly about how Social Justice Fund sees this alternative. Um, you know, this is like, this is the fun part and I really appreciate what you all said too. Um, and, you know, Ruth talking about just like really leaning into this space and, you know, with love to, to try to transform these things, not to reject them. Like, you know, I, I, like I said at the beginning, like I, I'm kind of all about philanthropy, even as I have some of these critiques, like, it, it feels so important to me to try to improve and get it right that that we gotta we gotta you know grapple with this stuff and search. Um, so I want to talk about three things that Social Justice Fund does to try to come up with a, a better social justice philanthropy, um, as we call it. One is is thinking about the the who. So um, who who gets the funding? Who gets funded? Um, and the last question, when I talked, I talked about sort of how foundations maintaining power and control over the, the resources and kind of bringing together coalitions and everything. The, the flip side of that is like actually trusting grassroots organizations to do the work. Give them the money, let them do the work, and, and know that, that it's going to happen, that they're actually the ones who know best because they're out there on the front lines fighting the good fight doing the work. Um, and especially if we're supporting groups that are led by the people and the communities that are most, inf uh, most affected by the kind of social problems we're talking about. Institutional racism, economic inequality, climate change. It should be the folks who are most affected by th those things, who are on the front lines, who, who get the funding and, and who get to decide how they're gonna strategize and, and, and fight their fight not the foundations. Um, the second thing is, is the how. So who, who is making those decisions um, to, to decide to fund those kind of groups? Um, and what Social Justice Fund has done has come up with a, a new model which we call giving projects, um, which brings together a cross-class, multiracial group of folks over, over the course of six months, they build community, they do trainings on, on race and class and privilege and oppression, they uh, raise money together, they ultimately read grant proposals and go out and, and do site visits, and, and at the end they, they make the grants. Um, so it's a, it's a democratized process, there are more people involved. Um, and the other thing that's really important is that they're actually raising money from their friends and family. So they're becoming donor organizers. And this idea that like more people can be involved in philanthropy is really important too. It's not just something that like big rich people who have foundations do. It's something we all do and should be part of. Um, in fact, the, the bulk of money that goes to, to grassroots organizing comes from individuals, not from big foundations. So, so we can do this and we can be involved and I think what Social Justice Fund tries to do is to, to kind of give people the confidence and the capacity to go out and, and do that, to be donor organizers themselves. Um, 
And then the last thing is, is, is the what. And, and again, like, it kind of goes back to the who, but it's also about what, what are we supporting. Um, our, you know, we, we think that social change is going to come about because of community organizing, because of people coming together and building strength and building power from below and then pressuring the people with power to make change. And, and unfortunately in this country, like a very small fraction of the money that gets uh, donated actually goes to organizations that are doing community organizing. A lot of it, you know, the biggest piece of the pie is like religion, um, religious and faith-based organizations, endowments for uh, higher, higher education, you know, Harvard University has like a $40 billion endowment now. That's probably the biggest chunk is, is higher education, social services. But down at the bottom is this tiny little sliver of like community organizing. So not only do we think that that's the best way to, to bring about social change, but it's also absolutely necessary because it's not getting funded right now. Not enough. And so we need to shift the whole paradigm. If we really, you know, in this political moment, especially when we're struggling against, a, you know, a, a right-wing president and growing white supremacy and white nationalism and, and all this stuff, like, we need to be supporting the kind of work that's going to bring about change. And that's community organizing. That's people most affected by these problems who are on the front lines fighting, fighting the good fight. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Sure. Um, I am just going to build on what Burke said. Can you hear me okay? Great. Um, so, yes, similar to what Burke said, for us, um, an alternative to conventional philanthropy or, or what is social justice philanthropy for us is to engage in relationships of mutual trust, mutual learning, and mutual accountability. Mutual trust means, first of all, investing in and supporting the communities that we're trying to help. The data is really stark when it comes to scientific globally. And I, I can say this for Africa, less than 2% of the money that goes into Africa actually goes to groups and movements led by Africans. In the United States, less than 6% of the money for communities of color goes into groups and movements led by people of color. The mutual trust means people have the answers. They have the solutions. Trust them, move the money, invest in them. And that also means provide flexible core general support. Let them make their own decisions about how resources are used within the organization. It also means committing to a partnership that is long term. Change is not linear, it's long and cyclical. Sometimes you have to go backwards to go forwards again um, and to really. Um, transformation, we have to accompany our partners for the long term. Long -term. Change doesn't happen in a three or in a three or five year timeline. It takes more time. Um, and it also means a commitment to learning. We have learned tremendously from our partners. Some of our most promising initiatives have come from our partners. Our most recent area of change was influenced by our partners. The blend of your fund co-designed with our partners. Um, Everything that we do, actually, we can talk with our partners. When we developed our new strategy, we went back to our partners to make sure that we're learning from them and they're leading the process and in terms of how we ourselves are changing and thinking about that work. And that also means um, staying the course with our partners as they continue to learn and as they may make mistakes. Um, we have, you know, I'll give one really short example of a group in Guatemala called Afedes. When we started with them, they were doing microcredit for women. And a lot of the women were actually engaging in um, conventional farming using chemical fertilizers and so on. At one point, they realized we're not doing our community service. They're, they're entrenched in debt. We're not solving the problems we intended to solve. So we want to stop what we're doing and engage in a process of reflection and dialogue. And they did that, and what came out of that reflection and dialogue is they said, we want to do this for our own freedom and autonomy. That means we don't want to do microcredit anymore. It means we want to go back to our ancestral practices like the sovereignty. It means we want to actually do political education of women, not give them microfinance. Um, and it also means we want to work to protect our indigenous resources, including our textiles. Many of their funders left us when they made that change, and we decided to stay with them. 
What's happened today is they've completely transformed the organization. They are working from a much more grounded, empowered, empowered political place. Um, they are decolonizing their work and their approaches, and they've already decolonized it. Um, and they're actually having impact around the world, not just within their communities. I'm not sure how many people heard about the case um, a that is brought to the Constitutional Court of Guatemala. They brought a case to protect the indigenous weaving and indigenous textiles from foreign corporations that were stealing it. And the Constitutional Court has heard it and moved it forward. They've received support from uh, numerous congressional members within the Guatemalan Parliament, and, and they're still working to make this national policy. Um, had we not stayed with them, had we not stayed through their mistakes and learnings, we would have missed out on this opportunity to learn from them, to be inspired by them, and to be transformed with them um, as they transformed themselves. I'll stop there. Awesome. Thank you all so much for sharing these really inspiring stories and um, thinking a lot about leaning in with love and feeling excited about that. And also feeling really excited about all of your questions. I wish I could ask them all, but I'm just going to read a few and then we can kind of answer them together. Uh, first, very important question. Does Gates donate to agriculture in Wakanda? <laughs> <laughs> good one. This is a good question. Um, okay. In all seriousness. Um, so we're here in the belly of the beast. And the people I organize to play with tend to focus on the effect of wealth in our region. Example, um, afford unaffordable housing, displacement, making, um, mounting barriers for houseless people. And is there a way to build a narrative that encompasses both local struggles and global solidarity? It seems that many of these people are at the, many of the people at the top are the same. So thinking about local struggles and global solidarity and how to, how to build those struggles together. Uh, the next question I want to ask is for white people and leaders to change the conversation on philanthropy and move the needle towards equity, how do you work through and navigate the idea of white salvation in your work? And then finally, we have a few questions about divestment. Um, so Ruth, you mentioned uh, becoming invested and engaging in contradictions as a big part of philanthropy and big investing. And what are your thoughts on divestment versus working as an activist shareholder to make change? Um, yeah, do you all have ideas about where you want to start? Do you want to do, you want to do this one, Ruth? Yeah. <laughs> all right, OK. Thanks for the question. Um, <clears throat> so um, my thoughts on divestment. Uh, so I, I guess when I'm thinking about social justice movements, I'm thinking about a part of the movement that's about saying no to something that is like really bad that's happening uh, and stopping things from happening. And there's a part that's also about saying yes, saying what are we for, what are, cre what are we creating, and what are we moving into? Um, so I see divestment as an amazing tool for saying no. Uh, for things like apartheid in South Africa, I think the fossil fuel divestment movement is really cool. Um, and I think uh, that's a great way to say no to the fossil fuel economy. And then the next question is what kind of economy do we want to build? Um, so I see divestment as like a really great, important part of a complete movement with both the no and the yes. Um, I almost said yo and <laughs> ness. Anyway. Um, so as far as uh, shareholder activism, um, I'm not sure if everyone here is familiar with it, um, but it's kind of if you have a stock, you can vote. If, if, you have, if you're a shareholder in a, in a company, you can vote. OK, this is kind of complicated now that I'm thinking about it. But you can vote um, on issues that, that come up in, in the company. And you can say, like, no, we want to curb executive pay, or like, no, we uh, want gender equity in the board or, or things like that. Um, and again, it's a really cool tool. Um, and, uh, and there's, there's a lot of, uh, companies and movements that are trying to like limit how much, uh, shareholders can actually do and how, how much they can actually vote and what they can actually vote on. Um, cool tool. If you want to do it, it's, it's a cool tool to use. Yeah. Um, and again, it's, it's part of that, like, 
multi multiplicity of strategies. Do you want to say something about that? Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> I, I just fun like sto fun story about uh, uh, that kind of shareholder activism. Um, back in 2003, actually, CAGJ and some local investors um, brought up some activists from Mexico because Costco was trying to build a store in Cuernavaca, Mexico. Um, and uh, was di displacing people and destroying this this kind of uh, you know sacred forest and, and a museum, and uh, so we, we had this uh, protest at a at a Costco shareholders meeting, um, and it it was kind of uh, you know shareholder activism at its best. Like we shut down the meeting, and they and we were on the front page the next day instead of like. Uh, Costco's, you know, profit gain and everything else, and I think that's there's potential, especially, and it speaks to this like local and international solidarity. The fact that we were able to bring some activists from Mexico who took the mic and spoke to 500 Costco shareholders and told them why this this idea of building a store um, that was going to destroy their community was a bad idea. Um, that was that was pretty amazing, and they eventually pulled the mic or pulled the plug on those people, and and that's when we we shut down the meeting. But um, it, it it has a lot of potential, as as Ruth was saying, and and so I, I also I agree that it's exciting. Um, the one other thing I was going to speak to really quick is this question around um, white saviorism, um, white salvation, which I think is kind of. Do you think that's what we're talking about? The it's navigating the idea of white white salvation. Um, I mean, it makes me go to the to the concept of the the white savior complex that people have probably heard about. Um, and I think it is at the root of a lot of philanthropy um, that, you know, that people who, who genuinely do recognize that there are problems in the world and want to do something about them. And as they start to kind of get into it and, and donate money and get a lot, a lot of praise and credit and, 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 and be out there as someone who's, who's doing change, doing good for the world. Um, you know, you, you can't help but sort of get sucked into that. Um, and I know, I mean, I see it even amongst the more, most progressive people in resource generation, and myself included, like it's, it's, a, it's a danger, it's a trap that, that we can fall into. And I think it's really important to find ways, if you are doing philanthropy, whether it's through a family foundation or through a giving project or a giving circle or whatever, to, to build in accountability so that you aren't Turning in, turning it into some way of sort of coming up to you know to your own salvation, to your own, and, and making yourself make it about making it more about you than than what is actually being supported. And so there are ways to do that. I think um, it's like I said, it's a danger. But I think if if we are actually partnering with the groups that we're that we're supporting, um, the grassroots groups that I was talking about before, and asking for them to sort of critique the way that we're doing philanthropy, asking for feedback, asking for, for you know, support in how we do it, then I think we're gonna do a better job and not fall into this trap of, of white saviorism or, or white, white salvation. Yes, Simone and Salome, I would love to hear your uh, take on this global local question. I go first, or you still me? Okay. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I really appreciate that question um, around how do we connect local struggles and, and global solidarity and, and what we're talking about, because um, my question was about, like, that we're, we're in the belly of the beast and that there is so much wealth in Washington State and in our region, um, and the reality of of um, what it costs to live here and how that impacts people. Um, and also, uh, you know, thinking about these, that capitalism as a global system. Um, and yeah, I, I think that um, it's, actu it's, it's necessary for us to think about our movements as global movements. Um, our struggles are inherently linked and, and whether we are talking about access to housing um, and gentrification and displacement um, from our communities or um, talking about displacement from land and, and uh, the sort of also displacement from the access to, our, to food systems and, and, um, and agricultural development. Um, this, the, the structural problem is, is, is all one and the same in that, in that um, 
the institutions and the individuals and, and the foundations and just the, the wealth that is held um, is driving forward the same capitalist structures that, that keep people disempowered. Um, so I think that actually what made this question made me think of too is, is movements around anti-imperialism and movements pushing back against state um, repression um, and also lab labor movements um, and, and people organizing for um, basic human rights. Um, and so I feel like in order to, to really emphasize those links between local struggles and global solidarity, um, it's around like changing our narrative. So like, why are people displaced from housing um, and, and why is gentrification playing out in Seattle? Um, what does the technological development and like these big tech companies in Seattle have to do um, with the way that the, the labor and production is happening around the world to produce the products and to carry out the, um, the businesses and whatnot that are, that are um, headquartered here, for example. Um, and I think changing, changing that narrative to focus on the, um, the, like, the labor and the production um, and the fact that like, the people who are on the receiving end of these impacts um, are experiencing similar conditions um, is incredibly important. Um, and I'm also really, really, really inspired by movements like La Via Campesina, which is the international peasant movement um, organizing for food sovereignty, which has chapters in, on pretty much every continent, um, including the US, and is basically like, doing such a good job of articulating a really intersectional movement around food sovereignty that is um, strongly anti-capitalist and also very feminist and very much um, centering the leadership of people of color and of women um, and queer people and, um, and, and bringing in, tying in together that like our struggle is a global struggle. Um, if we are to talk about how we can transform our own communities, we have to, we have to connect with people who are fighting across the world. Um, the, especially, you know, the rise of, the, of, of white nationalism and, and the right here in the United States is happening in other places. Um, and so our solidarity is incredibly important to lift up each other's stories and also to provide us with hope um, and that we're not struggling alone in our isolated communities or, or even um, not in, you know, in our borders, um, but that we are all like working together to transform. Um, so yeah, that's what I would say to that. Yeah, no, I think similar to what Simone said, um, if we're really talking about systemic change, the systemic causes of injustices and inequality at the global le level are super linked, right? So we have to facilitate those local global connections. And at Thousand Currents, we have an explicit focus on that. Our theory of change includes the focus on global solidarity and our new strategy also includes that and life building solidarity focus through our movement leading, movement leading work. And what that means in practice is actually, um, is uh, for example, we work to connect uh, our partners in the Global South with like-minded groups in the United States. So we partner visits, peer exchanges, and then the exchanges. Um, we make sure that we play an active role in movements, networks, and donor affinity groups that, that work both domestically and globally um, so, that we, so that we can play that intermediary and connecting role between the local and global. Um, it has also had its, its expression through even our fiscal uh, sponsorship of Black Lives Matter, which is sponsored a thousand times. That is an effort at uh, facilitating the local global linkages and also uh, standing in solidarity and working in solidarity. So it is a core part in focus. And uh, while we do fund in the global south and fund groups that work at the local, regional, and international levels, it's really important for us to also make sure we're cross-pollinating and cross-fertilizing across movements, regions, and, and physical and geographic differences. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, so I want to add this question. Is philanthropy, even social justice philanthropy, supplanting public services that the government should be providing via progressive taxes? And how do we account for this effect? Mm. Just a few minutes, <laughs> quick thoughts. <laughs> Good one. Um, 
Anybody else want to start? Um, one thing I forgot to mention is that maybe people picked up the, the green sheet when you were coming in that has a comparison of social justice, philanthropy, and philanthropic capitalism. Um, just wanted to, and in some cases it was, it was white because we ran out of green paper. Um, so just wanted to make sure people have a chance to look at that and think about it um, and give feedback because we're trying to kind of put that together as a resource that, that folks can use. Um, so on this question um, of of supplanting social services, um, I think it's it's real and uh, it's it's something we didn't really talk about before. But the one thing that I would say that I was going to mention, and I mean, I did talk a little bit about the tax structure and how that plays into philanthropic capitalism and this idea. I read somewhere that that Warren Buffett, when he uh, contributed a, a chunk of his fortune to the Gates Foundation, that ultimately that meant the tax, the tax benefits that he received from that meant that $10 billion did not go into federal coffers. And that's, that's money that would be, that's, that's public money. We can think of that as our money because essentially like that's, that's the money that pays for Social Security and Medicaid and Medicare and, and the, the services that people depend on in this country. So if it goes into a foundation, it's not taxed and, the, and we don't have access to that money anymore. And I think that's a real, that's, that's, that's the one problem with this, this idea of, so not only is our, our foundations thought to be sort of supplanting, well, we, maybe we don't need as much government funding, maybe we don't need social security because the foundations are gonna save the day. Well, I, I would challenge that notion like really fundamentally, like the government is actually, when, when it comes to social insurance and things like that, the, 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 the thing we can depend on and the thing that is accountable to us um, as, as citizens who vote for, for, these, for, for people who are making decisions about how that money is spent. And, but the other problem is that, that, that the money that, that goes into philanthropy isn't taxed and therefore we're, you know, we're doing exactly what the right wing wants, which is, is uh, what is it, uh, what's the phrase for it? Draining the beast? So, no, no, no. I'm, I'm mixing my metaphors. Starving the beast, starving the beast. That's what the right wing wants to do is, is, is take as much tax money out of the government so that there's no longer any need for these programs and they can cut them all. And, and so philanthropy actually can like very much play into that strategy and we need to be very wary of that. Yeah. Uh, do any of you folks want to add? You know, I didn't hear the question clearly. Oh. I've been having trouble hearing your questions, so I've been going off of answers to <laughs> guess what the question is. <laughs> so I think this is about, is philanthropy uh, replacing government and public, the public sector? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's a fantastic question. Um, and uh, listen, I think, I think we should all work in philanthropy, right? The ultimate goal is a world in which this form of philanthropy is not, is not needed because we've transformed systems and structures to be more just and more equal. Um, the question made is what do we do in the medium term? While we work to dismantle the system, how do we transform it towards, this, <laughs> towards its own self-destruction in a positive way, right? Um, in that respect, I think the type of philanthropy that's, that's in bed with the private sector and big business um, the type of philanthropy that's studying government, government agendas and policies is dangerous, and it's one that we should critique and attempt to change immediately. Um, but I think there's also an important role that philanthropy can play in supporting groups and social movements that are holding their leaders accountable, that are modeling and creating alternatives that are going to take us out of this entrenchment that we're in within capitalism, that are creating our better futures or imagining our better realities. I do think philanthropy has a significant role to play in supporting and strengthening these initiatives and movements and ideas so we can ultimately get to a world in which uh, we don't have the philanthropy or we don't have the existing form of philanthropy um, that's based on just an ordinary amount of wealth held by very few. Thank you for that, Salome. And I think um, this idea of imagining better realities and working to, to end philanthropy ultimately is a good place to turn the questions back to you all. Um, so I'm gonna ask you <laughs> to find somebody sitting next to you <laughs> And uh, talk to, I'm going to give you 10 minutes so you can each share for five. 
to answer two questions. The first is, how has philanthropy impacted you and your community? And the second is, how has what you've heard today shifted the way you think about philanthropy and or capitalism? So find a neighbor and talk amongst yourselves. Heather's going to say a quick word. Hi, everybody. My name is Heather Day. I'm the director of Community Alliance for Global Justice. And I just wanted to um, encourage us all to think about the, one of the core things about grassroots organizing is, of course, funding um, grassroots organizations and that making a donation to a grassroots organization really is a political act. And I can speak to that from experience as an organization that has been targeting the Gates Foundation for over 10 years and we had a big Costco campaign and, you know, we, we can't take on um, institutions like that without being grassroots funded, meaning that we have members make small donations. Um, some foundations are supporting our work now and we especially appreciate the funding um, we're getting of Augur Watch because, you know, if you are critiquing philanthropy, it's hard to get philanthropy to fund you. And, you know, I can't tell you how many people have asked us if we've sought out funding from the Gates Foundation. You know, we're simply not going to be funded by the Gates Foundation. So all of this to say um, that if you want to make a donation tonight, um, there's a basket at the table in the back. Um, all donations will just help us cover the cost of the event. If we happen to raise more than the cost, then they'll be split between Social Justice Fund, therefore your money is going, you know, very broadly in the community, in the region, or to um, our organization. So we really appreciate um, donations and just, yeah, really encourage you to think of that as a political act that you can make tonight. And now um, folks are going to share um, other ways that you can take action. So thank you so much for being here tonight. Okay, I'm going to pass the mic back to our panel one last time just so they can each talk about um, where to go from here and how to get involved. Cool. Um, so if you're sitting here uh, hearing me talk about resource generation and saying, wow, I might be a young person with wealth. How do I get involved? Um, please uh, reach out. We'd love to, we'd love to talk. Um, we have a Facebook group where you can connect uh, and you also can... Uh, connect through the resource generation website um, as well as just talking to me if you'd like to do that. Um, yeah, I think I'll just say that um, and pass it on. Cool. Um, so CUGJ and AgriWatch welcome you to get involved in our volunteer-led local and transnational organizing. Um, let's see, there are, there are definitely many ways to get involved. Um, and I would love to talk to you about that. Um, Heather is also available to talk about that. Um, and also just want to mention a few things. So we really value leadership development and developing like our political analysis and, um, and understanding more ways so we can take concrete action. So um, with the leadership of Emma as well, we've, we are developing an um, AgriWatch campaign orientation and uh, that training, it's, a, it's like a campaign training, and that will happen on Sunday, May 6th, um, from 3 to 5.30 p.m. at a Seattle location to be determined, and there are um, flyers for this at the table in the back, um, and that's just a really good way to come and actually learn more and um, figure out how you can get involved and take a role in this as well. Um, and then two other things. Um, so CJJ plays a role in the, um, in the food sovereignty movement locally and regionally uh, through the US Food Sovereignty Alliance. Um, and so through this, we recently organized an agroecology exchange in which um, 10 farmers and farm workers of color went to South Africa um, to exchange knowledge and practices around agroecology and political organizing. And two of those, um, two of the delegates are actually from Washington, um, Edgar Franks from Community to Community Development up in Bellingham, and, um, and Dean Jackson from Hilltop Urban Gardens in Tacoma. Um, so the two of them are coming here to Seattle to do a report back on that agroecology exchange, and we invite you to come to that as well. Um, it's likely going to be on Monday, April 9th, but please stay tuned for exact details about that. Um, and yeah, and then the last, the last thing is um, uh, we are also going to be 
hosting regional and national assemblies for the Food Sovereignty Alliance, um, and that'll be in October, timed around the World Food Prize, which is sort of the corporate version of like awarding Monsanto and big agribusiness giants for their amazing work in uh, combating hunger. Um, and we actually organize a, an alternative food sovereignty prize. Um, so we're gonna be hosting these regional and national assemblies around October and, and would love to have people get involved. I just want to add one other thing that's a, in the, part of our Food Justice Project organizing, which is the other big aspect of CAJJ's work. We're really proud that we just produced our first film. Um, it's called Salmon People, the Risks of Genetically Engineered Salmon for the Pacific Northwest. Um, so we're challenging GE Salmon. It's the first ever animal to be approved by cons for consumption by humans anywhere and um, it hasn't come to market yet. There's a lot of great organizing that has already happened and that we can continue to do to keep GE Salmon off the market and Northwest tribes are playing a leadership role in this and CAGJ has been amplifying that in one of the main ways they asked us to make this film and we did. So we'll be launching it in the next couple of months and just wanted to also give you a heads up to keep an eye out. There'll be a national webinar um, to raise awareness about the issues with GE Salmon um, with some of the tribal leaders and then there'll also hopefully be there'll be various local events. So just wanted to give you a heads up about that. Cool. Um, yeah, I just want to give a, a shout out to CHEJ for making this happen and taking the initiative. Um, and, and inviting Social Justice Fund and Resource Generation and, and Thousand Currents. Um, and also shout out to Salome for being on remotely. I know it's not easy. Um, but even though it was hard to hear at times, we definitely could hear a lot of what you said and really appreciated your, your input and, and having you on. It was really valuable. Um, just in terms of Social Justice Fund, a couple things to mention. Um, the giving projects that I talked about before are a great way to get to get involved and to go to go really deep um, because it is like six months of, of involvement. Um, there's information on the back table there about upcoming giving projects. Um, there's a, a environmental justice project that starts in the in the fall, um, and then other ones, um, in, and also a black led organizing uh, project that starts in the fall, and then other ones in 2019. Um, we also are doing some upcoming workshops, which I invite you all to, to come to. One is a, a giving plan workshop, so how to make your personal social justice giving plan. If you're thinking about giving away more money and, and want to do it like within the framework that, that we've been talking about a little bit tonight, we'll give you some advice on how to do that, how to budget, how to think about which groups to support, how to be strategic in your, in your personal giving. So that's on uh, April 12th at the Social Justice Fund office. There's a flyer about that as well. And then we're also doing a fundraising, a full day fundraising workshop for people of color um, on April 15th. Um, and that'll be led by uh, one of my colleagues, and it's a, it's a great workshop um, applying sort of grassroots fundraising principles and, and how to go out and raise money from friends and family and, and others for your organization or, or whatever you're up to, um, and it's specifically for, for people of color. Um, so those are some of the things we got coming up, and thanks again for having us. Salome? Hi, I want to thank Bert, Simone, Ruth, and Emma for inviting me into this important conversation and for all the participants, guests that I cannot see right now, but I really appreciate you listening through all the technical challenges. And so I want to thank you for that. Um, and in terms of Southern Currents, um, we would love to thank that with you. And the entry point for that is um, if you could visit our website, southerncurrents.org and sign up for our, our newsletter. Um, that way we can stay in, in consistent and ongoing touch with each other. We also have opportunities um, that can engage individuals that are interested in deepening their relationship with us. Um, we have a young professionals group, which is currently actually based in the Bay Area and comprised of 600 plus young professionals that learn together, um, deepen their practice on social justice issues together, and that also act as um, 
ambassadors and advocates of the work of our partners in our organization. And we're really thinking to expand that network nationally. Um, so we, if anyone is interested, we'd love to be in conversation with you about that. Um, similarly, while we provide grants to groups in the global south of working on food sovereignty, economic justice, and climate justice, we also know that we can't be the only actor doing practice in social justice philanthropy or one of the few. There are others, obviously. Um, so we focus um, significantly on scientific advocacy and, and transforming the sector. And in that respect, we have what we call the Thousand Curves Academy, uh, which to this point has been a week-long training for anyone who's interested in exploring or deepening their understanding of or practice in giving and philanthropy. So if you're interested in that, again, I invite you to check out our, our website, thousandcurrents.org, um, and try to attend one of our academies, um, which would be a great entry point. Lastly, um, I think that I haven't said this before, but we are a foundation that raises money to give money, and all of the money we raise from individuals goes directly to our partnerships. So if anyone has been moved or compelled to engage in any form of scientific relationship with us uh, um, in the form of giving, we also, I also invite you to reach out um, through the website or directly to me um, by emailing Salome at thousandcurrent.org. Thank you again. Thank you all so much. Um, thank you so much to our panelists for sharing your time and knowledge and to all of you for being here. We really appreciate it. Um, and to Mike McCormick, who's filming and is going to post this on YouTube. And um, yeah, we, thanks for being here. If you have time on your way out, we'd love to hear from you. You can post on these signs around the room about where to go from here. Have a great night. Thanks.